welcome to the second annual, we can say now, second annual Demo Day. And thanks for everyone for coming out in the bad weather and being here. Uh, particular thanks to all the, the uh, members of the team who made this happen, uh, to all you advisors and mentors who have worked so closely with uh, all the companies to help them get to where they are today. We had a little sneak preview last night. You're good. These guys are really good. They, they are going to, uh, they're going to, you're, you're in for a treat. Uh, so I'm Bobby Robbins. I'm the president and CEO of the Texas Medical Center. And, and I was instructed to give you a little slideshow here to tell you about for all of those uh, of you who are not from Houston and don't know about the medical center, just to give you a little uh, a vision of our little town here uh, that sits, uh, the downtown actually sits in the shadow of the medical center, as you can see from this slide. But it, it really is the largest medical center in the world, and this just depicts some of the statistics that we quote all the time. Uh, you know, over 100,000 employees, 8 million patient encounters, a lot of business for digital health companies, which you'll hear more about today. Uh, we have over 9,000 beds, 50 million square feet of space that we're going to increase uh, by 10% over the next two or three years. Uh, so it, it clearly is the largest medical center in the world. And our job when we came in was how do we get these 57 different institutions to work together more colla co uh, collaboratively and cooperatively. So these are the five areas that uh, through a strategic planning process uh, that, that uh, was about 200 people that worked together over a year to come up with these five uh, different areas. We don't have time to run through all of them. But you can see number one there is innovation and commercialization. We've got the largest clinical operation in the world. We've got a very strong research portfolio with, with uh, several billion dollars a year in NIH and NSF funding. But what we've been missing was the, uh, the bridge across the so-called valley of death. That's the intersection of translating the fundamental discoveries into commercializable products, whether they be new drugs, new medical devices, new diagnostics, or new digital health solutions that improve human health. So you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, today. Uh, the Innovation Institute, where this is the accelerator uh, that, that uh, these companies have been working uh, in over the last several months. But there are actually four components to the Innovation Institute. Uh, which is one of our five strategic institutes. There's the accelerator here. Uh, just behind uh, that wall, there's uh, space for co-working space for companies that are sort of beyond the, the accelerator incubator phase. Behind me is J Labs. If you haven't had a chance to go through J Labs, it's a phenomenal 30,000 square foot facility with state-of-the-art uh, class AAA, I would say, lab space and uh, meeting space that we uh, we're very happy to have the corporate partner Johnson & Johnson and J-Labs running that for us. In the back, you'll see, uh, if you walk around the curtain, uh, next week, I think it is, will be the opening of the AT&T Foundry. So AT&T have innovation centers around the world, but this is the first one totally dedicated to digital health. So all of these companies are, are glad that they're going to be here that you'll hear from today. And then Bill has a partnership with Apple that was just announced a few months ago. So all of these components make up the, uh, the in Innovation Institute. The final component is the biodesign program. And in addition to the 15 accelerator companies you'll hear from today, we've got a, a special opening act, if you will, from the biodesign teams. And you'll hear more about that uh, in, in a moment uh, from, from uh, Farzad, who helps co-direct that program. So biodesign is, uh, is a program that was really started at Stanford, I, I believe, by Paul Yock. And, and we'll say a few more words about that in just a second. But I wanted to show you this video. It's about two minutes. Uh, I just saw it for the first time a few minutes ago. So. <laughs> TMCX is a place where companies can come in, grow their company, accelerate their company, learn about their product and the market fit for their company, and uh, really get engaged with probably the most robust uh, healthcare network in the country. Being in this environment, having this place in an old factory that's been renovated and, and provides that uh, collision of uh, networking capabilities so that you can brainstorm with others uh, while you focus on your own team, uh, allows you the ability to be successful. 
I don't think there's a place like this in Houston that you come in and it feels this clean and bright and innovative and fresh. So I think our whole team feels really invigorated to make this home um, and to come in every day and not know who you may run into and can share ideas with. I think that's a value that this space offers over any other I could imagine. You walk in, there's this open space, disruptive innovations written on the wall. There's all these great minds and people thinking about you know, complex problems and, and sharing ideas on how we're going to make a difference. It, it, it's, it's the best place to, to let that passion, that energy come out. This place drives creativity. This place inspires me because it's a fostering community for innovation. Um, there's not a lot of places where you can come in every day and everyone is supportive and helping you and looking at you as an entity that that may need that support now but will take off with just a little help. If I made a list of everything that I wanted to get out of participating in this accelerator, I would now be able to check off every box on that list. And there's no way I would have been able to check off those boxes if I hadn't participated in the accelerator, if they hadn't accepted our company, and if I hadn't had the guidance and support of the people here. That was a very nice introduction, and you'll hear from some of the stars of the film here in just a moment. I just wanted to say one more word uh, about the biodesign process. So we're blessed with the largest medical center and clinical uh, volume in the world. Uh, the biodesign process is a textbook that was written by Paul Yock and uh, those of us who helped him get that program started at Stanford 15 years ago. Uh, that, it, that the, the hypothesis is that biodesign is a teachable discipline. And this biodesign program is really meant to be an educational program, and you'll hear from the two teams of what they've been through. But essentially what they do is they go out through a clinical environment and look at everyday problems that need solutions. So they may come back with a thousand uh, needs that they've uh, they found that need to be addressed, and they whittle it down, uh, all these needs, into uh, some final uh, projects that they kind of vet and work through and you'll hear uh, what they've come up with at the end of, of the year of, uh, of being here. Uh, it's a very competitive group. You'll hear from uh, two teams, one digital health, one medical device team, but they were selected from over 500 applicants uh, in, in, to get to this final eight. We've got applications that are uh, in process right now for the next class and I think we've got about a thousand uh, applicants for eight slots. So Stanford traditionally has about 150 applicants. So we're clearly doing something right uh, here at the Texas Medical Center. You know, I've always said Stanford is uh, one small sort of 400, 500 bed hospital. We have the entire Texas Medical Center for these teams to go out and go through, uh, you know, 8 million patient encounters across 9,000 beds. I, I really wanted to get this program started when I first arrived over three years ago, but uh, Bill and, and our team had uh, a lot of things that we were trying to do, not the least of which was get the physical space ready for programs like biodesign and the accelerator to be in. And so uh, finally we found the ideal people to, uh, to lead this program. Uh, Eric Richardson, who's a professor at Rice who had worked at uh, Medtronic uh, and teaches a, a master's degree granting biodesign program at Rice, uh, has teamed up with uh, Farzad Soleimani who is a physician and faculty member at Baylor and was one of the uh, members of a biodesign program at Stanford uh, years ago. So I'm going to introduce now for Zod and ask him to introduce our two teams. Again, thank you all for being here. You're in for a great treat and uh, hang around after for some fellowship and refreshments. For Zod. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Farzal Solmani. I am the Associate Director of the Biodesign Program. And I've had the privilege of working with our Biodesign Fellows over the past nine months. Our fellows, David Kim, Dave Morris, Jason Peterson, Sean Diamante, they all have come from very diverse backgrounds. They got together in August of last year and they completed over 400 hours of observations, observing clinical practice and hospital operations in a variety of uh, settings. 
as uh, and in all of our member institutions here at Texas Medical Center. What they realized very quickly is that nurse retention and engagement remain amazing challenges for our hospital uh, administrators. Given that all of our patients interact first and foremost with the nurses, given that we have a shortage of nurses, we have a nursing crisis in this country, retaining and engaging and training high quality nurses is paramount. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you to the Nightingale. Good afternoon. My name is David Kim, and I'm one of the co-founders of Nightingale, a retention engine for nurses. Now, nurse retention is a tremendous problem, one that's costly and really time consuming. We spent over 300 hours doing 500 interviews and discovered that for hospital CEOs, nurse retention is a top five priority. And that's because one out of every six nurses is gonna quit this year, each costing $50,000 and nine months to replace. Now that's a $15 billion problem and one that's only continuing to grow because the US is facing a growing nurse shortage which will reach 1 million by 2020. And that cost doesn't even include the increasing costs of poor patient satisfaction and increased medical errors that come from disengaged nurses who are actually providing 70% of the patient facing care in the hospital. So Nightingale is a mobile software solution that directly addresses the major causes of nurse turnover in a way that distinctly addresses the needs of nurses. The major causes of nurse turnover include poor communication among staff, a lack of recognition for good work, a lack of voice in the organization, poor scheduling flexibility, and limited compensation. Uh, moreover, nurses are constantly on the run, a time constraint, working irregular shifts, and having to deal with patient privacy concerns. So, our software addresses this in three main ways. The first way is secure messaging and scheduling. Now this includes shift alerts. Shift alerts are public announcements of newly available shifts, extra shifts that nurses can pick up. This has proven to be a really sticky feature driving adoption, uh, which is used over 20 times per week by the average user. Digital reward and recognition allows a nurse to publicly recognize a nurse or a manager for the good work that they've been doing, the results of which are then broadcast by a newsfeed or leaderboard. And finally, continuous feedback. This is concise, structured feedback at the point of care, providing instantaneous feedback that enables a culture of continual coaching, which has been proven to be a lot more effective than the annual review. So we believe we are uniquely positioned in a really fragmented marketplace, and that's because of our unique focus on nurses and the unique needs of nurses, especially the nurse manager, who we've discovered to be key at improving nurse retention. Our competitors, on the other hand, are focused on generic solutions, either not focused on healthcare or not focused on the unique needs of nurses. So we employ a per employee, per month pricing plan, which lets a hospital break even on the cost of our software if Nightingale saves only one out of 60 nurses who will typically quit each year. That's a tremendous potential ROI and something we're really excited about. So our team brings a diverse set of skills. We have over 10 years of enterprise software development experience, backgrounds in venture capital, investment banking uh, at McKinsey, BlackRock, and Oppenheimer. We have a set of advisors that include uh, many nurses from across uh, TMC and serial healthcare entrepreneurs. And we've been applying our technologies and testing it against over 100 users and executives, of components live within the Texas Medical Center and hospitals here, and are preparing for a second hospital pilot as we speak. We're currently applying to accelerators, looking for seed funding, and looking for additional nurse partners. We are Nightingale, a retention engine for nurses. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to tell you about a patient story now. Ken is a young, obese patient uh, who starts developing headaches on a daily basis to the point that he loses his minimum wage paying job. Over the ensuing, uh, uh, ensuing three months, he develops intermittent fever, chills, 
altered mental status, confusion. He visits three different hospitals in the Houston area, outside of the Texas Medical Center. Uh, he undergoes three expensive CT scans, and each time he's diagnosed with a typical migraine. I had the privilege of taking care of this patient this past Saturday night at Bentop Hospital. He came to us after one of his seizure episodes. Uh, we ended up performing a lumbar puncture on this gentleman, and we diagnosed him with a severe form of fungal meningitis. My suspicion is that he did not undergo lumbar puncture because most providers are hesitant to perform this procedure in anatomically complex patients. Our fellows, Jessica Traver, Nicole Moskowitz, Yashar Ganje, and Javier Garcia, spent over 400 hours, again, doing clinical observation. They came up with 400 plus needs, and they selected to work on this particular problem and the solution that they have developed, which makes lumbar punctures more intuitive, more convenient, and easier to perform. It's called Intuitav, and they are about to disrupt a procedure that has not changed over the past 100 years. And I introduce you to Jessica Traver, who's going to talk about uh, Intuitav. Intuitap has designed the first comprehensive solution to this problem. We utilize an array of tactile sensors that when placed up against the back can detect with greater sensitivity the underlying vertebrae, even through multiple layers of soft tissue. You can think of it as a stud finder, but for the spine. We also incorporate a needle guide to help physicians reliably insert the needle at a consistent angle, and we've eliminated the need for the cumbersome, currently used manometers to measure the pressure by incorporating a digital pressure sensor. Finally, our fluid collection system allows for sequential filling while also reducing the risk of exposure to potentially contaminated spinal fluids. We're increasing the accuracy of this procedure, so therefore we can be decreasing the physician frustration and also the unnecessary pain to the patient. By standardizing this procedure to be 30 minutes or less, we can increase emergency room throughput by, and saving hospitals an average of $600 per case. We've got a really strong team of four with backgrounds in engineering, business, and medicine, and we've been able to demonstrate our ability to meet key milestones in a short period of time. In just the past nine months, we've spent multiple hours vetting and validating this need, as far as I'd mentioned, with key stakeholders here in the Texas Medical Center. We've built and tested our beta prototype. We filed for a provisional patent, and we recently received IRB approval in order to test our um, imaging platform on humans. So we're now raising $1 million in order to continue the development of this product, and that will take us through an accelerator, will allow us to grow our team, build and test a beta prototype, convert to a utility patent, and submit our 510K application. Once again, we're in two tap medical. We're eliminating the guesswork from spinal taps. We'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. We're, our table's back there. We've also got a demo and, uh, of our prototype that we can show you. Thank you. I apologize in advance, my voice is going. So luckily, uh, I only have a couple of minutes to speak because that's probably about all my voice has left in it at this point too. So my name is Eric Halverson. I'm the director of the Innovation Institute here at TMC. Uh, what a fantastic start with our two biodesign. What a pre-show, pre in a way, opening, opening act, if you will. I just, I just want to re-emphasize again, the biodesign teams, they're 10 months into their program and they went from the 500 needs down to three, down to one, to a prototype, to IP, to company formation, to raising money. I mean, it's unbelievable the speed at which they're operating. Um, and again, just fantastic, fantastic progress so far. So um, again, so I just uh, wanted to introduce myself. And again, while my voice holds out, I wanted to say a couple of comments about our companies and also just a quick overview in terms of our accelerator process. Um, the other day I read, a, I read a quote that I thought was very interesting about entrepreneurs. It actually came from Shark Tank, if anybody watches, watches that show. Yeah. Um, so it said, entrepreneurs are the only people willing to work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is very true of our, of our entrepreneurs here as well. 
entrepreneurs and every single one of these folks and their entire teams represented here, um, they do a lot of things. What do they do? They create, they take risks, they follow their passion, and every single one of these folks is extremely passionate about what they're doing. They see obstacles not as obstacles, but as opportunities. And they sacrifice, and some of them sacrifice a lot, to build solutions that can benefit all of us. Over my 15-year career in Boston, I started probably over 20 companies. Six of those, I took operational roles, I took board roles as a founding member, therapeutics, devices, diagnostics, social robotics, a whole mix of different things. But the opportunity to come to Houston and join the Texas Medical Center, the biggest medical center in the country, as Dr. Robin said, the $2 billion of research and all the amazing organizations that are part of the TMC, was basically just too good of an opportunity to pass up. The opportunity to work with teams like this, entrepreneurs like Catherine, Alex, Laura, Adam, Tom, Kim, Santosh, and Amit, David, Ade, Jin, and Austin, and really all of their teams um, has just been such an honor and a privilege for me to be here today. And thank you, Dr. Robbins, thank you, Bill, for bringing me down here because uh, it's been my pleasure and hopefully will continue to be for many, many years to come. So thank you. <laughs> I consider the entrepreneurs that are in our group now friends, and I know that they're gonna forever be a part of the TMCX family um, and community. I'm really proud of each and every one of them. The progress they've made uh, is really gonna be evidenced by the traction that they've been getting both in TMC, across TMC, and across the country, which they're gonna highlight for you as well. Um, I was tempted to actually break out the initial videos they did on day one when they were here. Uh, but then we, I figured we'd spare them that as well, that embarrassment. But trust me when I tell you the progress is pretty amazing. So let me just tell you very quickly about our process, which started back in October of last year for our application process, where we had over 150 applications for this cohort. We used over 30 different reviewers. Many of you are in the uh, in the stand, well, not the stands, in the audience today, and we um, and we really targeted the best of the best. We really targeted 10 companies. We ended up with 12 because we really couldn't decide because they were really so good. Uh, we had about 50% of the applications and ultimately 50% of the companies we accepted are from Texas, and the other half come from around the country. At TMC and at the Innovation Institute, we celebrate the local innovations, for sure, coming out of Texas, coming out of the medical center, but we certainly welcome with open arms the companies from around the country with innovations that can transform healthcare, bringing them to Houston to work with the medical center and the great physicians um, and nurses and administrators who are here as well. So as you see, about six of our companies, these are the six that you'll get to know a little bit today, are from in and around Texas, or they're from in Texas. Um, across, outside of Texas, we have another six companies uh, that are spread out, but with a little density in California, as you can see there as well. Just quickly on some of the demographics, the breakdowns on our, on our companies, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, four of our founders are MDs, uh, CEOs and MDs. Four of our CEOs are female. And the average size of the companies that we have in our cohort is approximately five people per company. So these are early stage companies, obviously. The companies have been very successful since they've been here and before they got here in terms of raising venture capital of about $18 million. We have a number of them who are poised to close. I won't say who. I was going to prematurely announce which ones are set to close in the next month, but I promised I wouldn't. But it rhymes with, no, I'm just kidding, I won't do it. So, um, so they've been very successful and they're, and they're getting great traction there in terms of additional money raised. Um, and again, a lot of different engagements, both within TMC, across TMC, and outside that they're going to talk to you about in a little bit more detail. A little bit about our program. Um, over the course of the program, we really try to structure uh, a series of workshops, networking opportunities, facilitated introductions within the hospitals and the medical center, um, and then also allowing time for the companies to actually work on the company and work on their product. Uh, we did this by kicking off uh, the program with a two-week boot camp, a two-week very intensive boot camp based on lean methodology, folks familiar with that. Um, and really, the startups work on defining their value proposition, uh, determining their product to market fit, and gathering insights through customer discovery, a crucial part of what we force them to do here, um, and really the success for any early stage business, is breaking down their business into a series of hypotheses that they can then go test 
with users. And again, with the 8 million patient visits and the biggest medical center, you've got a lot of users that you can go reach out to. But it's certainly a little bit easier said than done. In addition to those kinds of uh, activities, we have a curriculum that we run here. We had 24 sessions uh, ranging on topics from IP and financing to hospital budgeting and procurement processes. We had four hospital tours and a number of other engagements. And our companies participated in six national and regional conferences, including HIMSS, South by Southwest, RESI, Medical World Americas, and Texas Life Science Forum, which actually offered them a number of opportunities to pitch and compete in competitions, a number of which were actually won by our company. So we're very excited about that. I want to take a time, um, and I'll say this over and over again, Dr. Robbins as well, a key to the success of this program is our advisors. I want to thank the advisors that we had. We had over 120 clinical advisors or advisors participating in our program from the 21 hospitals, uh, many of which are represented here today. In addition to the clinical advisors, we have a host of business and industry advisors that really work with the companies on all parts of the business model, finance, marketing, and partnerships and participate in mock board meetings and office hours and other uh, ways in which they can advise the companies. And then also our subject matter experts, including from the finance and legal areas. We actually run a legal Thursdays every Thursday where uh, the lawyers in a pro bono fashion advise our companies on legal matters that are uh, very difficult, costly, and can oftentimes kill an early stage company. So we're very thankful to all of our advisors. So again, I just want to thank you, thank the advisors again. Critical success, critical to the success of our program, so important that the companies really wanted to select one of their key advisors to introduce them today. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we had to call a little bit of an audible because a number of our advisors got stuck in Dallas or elsewhere due to the weather. Uh, but again, we're going to kick it off here and get our advisors coming to introduce the company. So without further delay, I'm going to introduce Brett Girard, who is here to introduce The Right Place. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Brett Giroir. I'm one of the resident advisors here at TMCX and former CEO of the A&M Health Science Center and director of the science office at DARPA. Transitions of care, most importantly from the hospital to post-acute care, are fraught with breakdowns in communication, expensive delays, patient and family dissatisfaction, and most importantly, lapses in the quality of care that can often lead to readmission and even serious medical complications. Not surprisingly, patients, healthcare professionals, and now the federal government are demanding change and solutions. But as they say in Texas, we can't get there from here. Why? Because transition to post-acute care is currently fragmented, it is manual, and usually performed in the absence of data. I am here because the right place is a breakthrough solution for all stakeholders that will potentially save billions of dollars in cost while improving the care for millions. Here to tell you about this innovative solution is Catherine Chambers, co-founder and CEO of The Right Place. Good afternoon. I need the clicker. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Chambers, co-founder and CEO of The Right Place, and we're helping hospitals discharge patients to post-acute care in a quicker, better, faster way. This is our co-founder, Dr. Alan Abrams, a Boston-based geriatrician who's been practicing geriatrics in the Harvard system for over 30 years. Dr. Abrams became frustrated with the way the discharge planning process was negatively impacting the outcomes of his patients. I've spent the past 15 years in the travel industry, perhaps worlds apart, but a partnership uniquely suited to fill this gap in care coordination. When I learned a little bit more about Dr. Abrams' frustrations, here's what really struck me. 40% of all hospital discharges require some form of post-acute care, and roughly half of those go to a skilled nursing facility or a SNF. Tragically, 24% of those patients are readmitted to hospitals within a 30-day time period, costing Medicare up to $17 billion a year and causing it a negative impact on those patient outcomes. What's more, 
80% of hospitals today rely on phone, paper, and blast fax solutions to manage this discharge process and communicating patient details with a network of SNFs they'd like to send a patient to. We can do so much better. We need to leverage technology for what it can do well. Consider the number of applications available to any of us to research a next to hotel vacation with real traveler reviews, filtering, and online booking engines. Or the number of applications we have on our smartphones that enable us to book a dinner reservation tonight by filtering mechanisms on cuisine, ambiance, or even payment method. Shouldn't the same be available in healthcare? That's why we created the right place. Let me show you how it works. We first provide a mobile solution to the skilled nursing facilities so they can manage all of their bed inventory and incoming referrals on one easy to use application that's manageable to access 24 seven from anywhere. This really becomes a central reservations platform for them. And importantly, we can track the trends coming through this application compared to the whiteboard methods that are used today. From here, we can expose this data to other stakeholders, such as skilled nursing facility operating companies, so they can look across their portfolio of operators to see what types of trends on length of stay and case mix are coming through their facilities. We have an application that we're now exposing to hospitals for those discharge planners to identify a skilled nursing facility for a patient they're trying to discharge by filtering on location, ACO alignment, special equipment that the facilities may have, and those that have an available bed for a patient that needs to be discharged really quickly. Further, our application allows the hospital to observe what happens to the patients after they leave the hospital. This is a really important component as we move to more value-based care, and hospitals and ACOs are wanting to manage and understand the outcomes of their patients through the post-acute continuum. We've had great traction to date. We're live in over 60 skilled nursing facilities in the Boston market. We are just wrapping up a pilot with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and two of the pioneer ACOs in the Boston market. Through the exposure through the digital health accelerator programs like HealthBox and now a TMCX, we're in good discussions with four health institutions here in Houston. And we're really proud to be the grand prize winners of the Athena Health Innovation Challenge that was just announced last month. This is just the beginning. We think the right place has great application to serve other segments of the healthcare continuum and matching the right patients with the right place of care in a better, faster, smarter way. And we look forward to telling you all more about it. Thank you. Good afternoon. When I first heard Alex Izaguera's pitch several months ago, it immediately resonated with me. My name is Aisha McCracken, and by background, I have built and run physician organizations for many of Houston's large health systems. So this idea of provider credentialing is something that I have worked with over and over and over again. The mostly manual uh, data gathering and sharing processes required by the credentialing process are among the most inefficient, costly, and frustrating processes in healthcare today. Alex Izaguera, his vision is to create a cloud-based solution to make this process hassle-free. I could very quickly see the potential in this. And by the way, his solution saves billions. So he'll tell you that in just a few moments and tell you more about that. My work with Alex began in early February. Since that time, I've seen Alex really narrow his fo focus, uh, uh, refine the solution, build a very strong team. And in that process, I've had the opportunity to work with Alex and his team as they have worked tirelessly to develop a unique and valuable uh, service offering. It's been really exciting. It's a lot of fun to work with the young energy and, and talent and, and innovation and to work with Alex and his team as they bring this vision to life. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Alex Izaguera, the CEO and founder of Apprenda Systems. Thank you, Aisha. Welcome to Demo Day. So, healthcare organizations seek to limit expenses, losses, fines, and increase revenues as much as possible. Yet, an innocuous activity such as keeping track of 
of information that you're collecting from and maintaining from clinicians and students has a tremendous impact on this. How? Let's take a look. Organizations today have to credential doctors. They need to rotate students. They need to keep provider directories up to date. And they need to do a lot of other things that require access to data. This process today is very manual and inefficient. And it's a source of frustration for both the clinicians and the institutions collecting that information. So what's the big deal? So you have data that's not collected well, it's bad, it's erroneous, it has issues, and there's no systems that are talking to each other in the back end. Well, it has a very big impact. Administrative costs are the largest, fastest rising uh, expenses in the US today for healthcare. It, they represent 25% of the, the total cost of healthcare. What's even worse is that 183 billion of that cost is due to inefficiencies in the process. Eight, 100, that's criminal. We should be spending that money on good, better things. So our technology, we're so pleased to, to introduce to you Signature. And Signature allows for you to be able to eliminate 20% of that, depending on how wasteful you are. You might be less. So how does it work? An organization can make a request to a clinician to share their data with them. That clinician accepts the request, and they can easily select from a library of attributes that they've collected over time and share individually with those institutions. But the beauty really comes into play when they make a change. Later, when our clinician decides that she's going to change her office hours, every institution that's connected to that data is connected and updated immediately. So the beauty of it is everything's up to date. There's no contacting multiple people, no trying to figure out when that's going to happen. It's elegant, it's simple, it's efficient, and the best part of it is it saves tons of time and money. So if you're not excited about the technology, you're going to get excited about our business model. Signature's free for clinicians to use. They don't have to pay for anything. Any institution that wants access to that data and, and receives information from that clinician pays $90 per year per clinician. So let's so take a look at our potential market here. If we only capture 10% of the clinician market and they're filling out four different forms for different institutions, that represents $432 million of annual recurring revenue. That's, that's incredible. Our team, we have a, uh, a team of 125 years of experience with expertise in IT, sales, marketing, education, and research. So our, our journey started fall of 2015. We decided to start commercializing this technology. We got accepted into the TMCX program. Since then, we've refined our value proposition. We've made improvements to our technologies. We've de developed strategic partners with Slalom, a very international, well-respected uh, IT firm, and PreCheck, an organization that provides screening and background check. Our technology is being used at Rutgers University, Baylor College of Medicine, and we rec recently signed on Next Level Urgent Care as our first customer. So we're in conversations with Community Health Choice, uh, other TMC organizations uh, such as Rice, MD Anderson, Methodist, Texas Women's University, St. Thomas, and many more. In 18 months, we'd like to get 5,000 users, generate $1.8 million in revenue, and develop some partners. We're looking to raise $1.2 million, and uh, we'd like to leverage those resources for operations, sales, and technology and salaries. At Apprentice Systems, we believe that empowering people with their data is the best way to move technology forward, the best way to get people collaborating together. And uh, we'd love you to come and see what we're up to and uh, see how we can save you resources so that you can redirect them towards patient care as opposed to administrative burden. Thank you very much. Hi there, I'm Dwight Clark. I'm with National Cardiovascular Partners. We're a outpatient cardiac cath lab owner and operator of 27 facilities currently, five more under construction and visions to take over the country. <laughs> but to do that, we need, need to define and partner with the best cardiologists in the country. We found CareSat Systems as a, 
a way to help us do that. One thing that we really key in on at National Cardiovascular Partners is a, a saying that since we develop physician relationships, we look at internally for employees and for partner vendors like CareSet, you can't do extraordinary things with ordinary people. And we found extraordinary people at CareSet. They, we first came to in, be introduced to them last fall, signed a pilot, and like any good young company, they said they could provide a solution whether they actually had it or not at the time. But they built it over the course of that and we decided to go ahead and sign a two-year agreement with them this past February because they come through and had demonstrated themselves to be very capable and great partners to work with. So let me introduce you to Laura Chaplin, the CEO of CareSet Systems. Thank you. Wow, what a great intro. So I'm Laura Chaplin, CEO of CareSet Systems. In my previous life, I worked as an energy trader, and my success really largely depended on knowing exactly where the market was at any given time. But in healthcare, market data is really expensive. It costs hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars a year. And then you get to pay for consultants and data analysts to tell you what it means. But what if you want to make big healthcare decisions, but you don't have a big healthcare budget? CareSet Systems offers a simple, intuitive, web-based software that helps healthcare executives working on the ground, like you, get access to the data and the insights that you need to make better business decisions in faster time intervals and with more certainty. And because our solution includes on-demand data science services, you're not gonna get stuck with a huge consulting bill at the end of it. We pair $488 billion of never-before-available Medicare claims data with our proprietary algorithms to give you a software that's powerful enough to do complex visualizations like this, but simple enough that you could actually use it yourself. In just the last month alone, healthcare executives have used our software to evaluate the need for dialysis centers in a market, to find and rank independent doctor practices to acquire, and to assess the referral patterns for five years for hospitals. This matters because your time and effort is critical to the success of you, your organization, and your career. And this is just the beginning, because soon we're gonna add custom dashboards and provider quality metrics so that you can make even more confident decisions in the future. I work with a really cool team. That guy is Fred Trotter. He's a health IT expert. He's been featured in Forbes, Wired, and US News, and he currently serves on the National Cybersecurity Task Force. That guy. That's Ashish Patel. He's been working with and selling to enterprise clients for more than 15 years. And me, I'm Laura. I helped a health IT startup go from concept to serving Fortune 500 companies. We're really excited about the results we're showing for our clients, like Dwight. We helped a founder of an ACO expand from one state to 11 states. A skilled nursing facility CEO assess leakage in the post-acute space. A hospital CEO increased surgical volumes by 50% in 90 days and a VP of business development at a lab protect millions of dollars in top line revenue. With CareSet systems at your side, you'll sleep better at night knowing that the risks you take for your business are the right ones. If you're a healthcare executive currently facing a challenge and our data and insights could help, I'd invite you to please stop by our booth. We'd love to talk with you. We're CareSet Systems, data science as a service, powered by Medicare. Thank you. And yes, I'm back again. Um, I had the good fortune of working with um, another company very closely and advising Sensely. Uh, imagine game-changing innovation, avatars, and artificial intelligence all being used to change the way patients interact with the healthcare system. When I heard that pitch, I was immediately interested in learning more about what Adam Odesky and his team at Sensely were doing. So in just a few moments, Adam will introduce you to Molly. 
Uh, Molly's currently being used by US clients in California um, in, in the Kaiser system, but she's one of several avatars working with patients across the globe. You'll also, you won't meet Olivia, but know that Olivia, who speaks with a British accent, interacts with patients who are um, taken care of through the National Health Services in the UK. Patients have been incredibly responsive to this platform. They're satisfied with their interactions, and what happens is that the outcomes, the health outcomes, and again, Adam will share those with you in just a moment, but they are stellar. So in the past several months, I've sat with Adam as he has presented the Sensely platform to local health executives. And the conversations would initially begin with, well, we've got processes and we've got technology. We were doing all sorts of things to take care of our chronically ill patients. But as Adam would carry on with his presentation, we would hear, wow, this is amazing. We've never seen anything like it. So it's a really interesting, powerful platform. Um, and over this time that I've had the opportunity to advise Adam, I've been amazingly impressed by the depth of his vision and the technical capabilities of his engineering team. They've created a platform that rapidly demonstrates uh, broad scale value today, but also remarkable possibilities for the future. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Adam Odesky, who is the CEO and founder of Sensely. That was amazing. Thank you, Aisha. That was, that was great. Uh, so we're Sensely, my name's Adam Odesky, and we're a virtual nurse, nurse platform that helps physicians better manage and communicate with their patients. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? So we all know about the disproportional share of costs that chronic diseases impose on our healthcare system. In fact, 5% of Americans account for over 50% of all the system's healthcare costs, and doctors and budgets are struggling to cope. The problem has really reached a crisis proportion. And we think that technology can really help, but not just any technology. We need deep patient engagement, we need actionable data, we need to create value for all the stakeholders in the ecosystem, including patients, providers, as well as the payers. And that's essentially why we built Molly. So Molly's unique user interface was purpose-built for deep patient engagement. It's mobile first, it combines a virtual nurse avatar with speech recognition, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and medical device integration. We're making patient interaction simple, intuitive, and also motivational, and we've proven it to be highly effective because of the power of the virtual human connection. Let me show you an example of how Sensely is being used in a heart failure setting by patients today. Our app can be a part of their lives every day. So our avatar Molly, she can check in with the patient every single morning, more than once a day if that's needed. She can ask the patients how they're doing. She can collect really important information such as their weight or their blood pressure, glucose levels, ask them relevant questions to whatever condition they might have. And all this information can be funneled back to the clinician seamlessly so that the clinician can just be alerted to which patients are actually possibly having an issue that day. Your weight is 190.9 pounds. You did not gain any weight. That's good. But that's not all the product does. Inside Sensely, we built an intelligence workflow engine that puts clinicians and care teams in control. Using Sensely, they can easily assign these sort of Molly assessments to their patients. Molly does all the monitoring and informs the clinicians if patients experience any unusual risks, such as weight spikes or high blood pressure, et cetera. Clinicians then can then immediately look at the record and perform an intervention, a medication adjustment, having the patient come into the office, a telemedicine visit. All that is done by the Sensely platform. So in a recent pilot that we did with Kaiser Permanente and heart failure, uh, we discovered that we slashed operational costs for the care team by over uh, uh, three times uh, without uh, impacting patient satisfaction at all. So patients are just as happy using Molly as they are actually talking to a nurse on the phone. Um, the other thing is that we increased capacity of the number of patients that nurses can manage by two and a half times. And the best part of all, we, in our programs today, we have not had a single readmission within 30 days on the same exact cohorts as the traditional uh, heart failure clinics. So we've been a company uh, for just over two and a half years and we've been fortunate enough to work with some of the largest names in the healthcare business, including the National Health Service of the, U of the UK, MetLife, UCSF, and Kaiser Permanente. Uh, all of our uh, contracts and deals right now are paid and we're expanding it more. And we've been uh, also in the last six months 
uh, creating a really engaging relationship with the Texas Medical Center, particularly the, in the institutions uh, outlined here. Uh, we've done it both on a partnership level as well as on a research level, and we plan to deploy to our first patients in the next few months. So we have to hope to continue working with the Texas Medical Center uh, and uh, create something great for patients and uh, have them live happier, healthier lives. Thank you very much for Sensley. Good afternoon, I'm Larry Luck. I'm one of the um, business analysts here at TMCX. I have um, the pleasure to work with these companies on a daily basis and am just extremely invigorated by the way that they're transforming this industry. Um, I'd like to introduce one company in particular now. Valera Health is a company focused on the current crisis in behavioral and mental health care. Um, one in five Americans, or 42 million people in this country suffer from a mental health condition and half of those are undiagnosed or uncared for. Now, whether diagnosed or not, these patients present a tremendous cost to the healthcare system because our most needy and highest cost patients are comorbid with medical and mental health conditions. Uh, to frame this problem yet another way, the New York Times recently published that suicide rates in our country have reached a 30-year high. So, Dr. Thomas Tsang, the founder and CEO of Valera Health, saw an opportunity to use technology to amplify behavioral health services and disrupt the way that we approach mental illness. Um, he's put together an exceptional team of data scientists, policy experts, behavioral health specialists, and engineers to solve this problem. He's an internist by training and as the chief medical officer of a federally qualified community health center in downtown Manhattan, has implemented a behavioral health model to serve 40,000 patients. He later served as a congressional staffer on the House Committee on Ways and Means, contributing to the Affordable Care Act. He was the medical director to the Office of Health IT and chief medical officer at Merck in the Services and Solutions Division. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Tseng. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, thanks a lot. I'm Tom Tsang, I'm CEO and co-founder of Valera Health. And as Larry um, so graciously introduced me, um, we have a really bad crisis at hand. Half of the country are short of providers. We need 3,000 psychiatrists just to fill the void. And in Texas alone, we need 1,000 psychiatrists. And what does that translate to? So we have patients who are the neediest and highest cost in the system that are, have comorbid medical conditions and mental health conditions costing three times more than patients with just pure medical conditions. And what we're seeing is really um, the consequences of all this is that payers and providers and governments recognize this problem are actually making a huge effort and initiative in, t in terms of getting care to these patients. And what are we trying to do? At Valera Health, we're reinventing behavioral health services through the use of data-driven and technology approaches added to human coaches. So we have four components. One is using population analytics to actually identify these individuals and risk stratify these people. And then we ask them to download an application on the cell phone that actually captures data and finds out exactly how they feel and sense exactly what's going on. And then we do care coordination using human coaches to actually work with these people and deliver light touch cognitive behavioral therapy and coordinate activities and telehealth visits. So a little bit more about each functionality. So in terms of the analytics, we work with payers and providers to actually identify the right care for the right patients. Not every single individual needs to see a psychiatrist, and we can actually manage 60% of these people with CBT right through the application. The application itself captures information directly from you and about you. We can get consent from the patient to collect passive data directly from your cell phone. So we collect 
light, your geolocation, your pitch of your voice. And the idea is to put all this information together and understand changes, changes that would actually get you the care that you need early on to avert a costly and bad outcome. And then we actually deliver content through the application where coaches can actually work with you, coordinate appointments, remind you on medications, and actually help direct your goal planning in terms of mindfulness training, stress reduction. And then lastly, we coordinate and work with individuals and actually coordinate um, scheduled telehealth visits with provider organizations. And so in essence, we have all the components in an end-to-end -end solution to amplify existing models at least threefold. So the value proposition for the patient is that there's accessible private care in the comfort of your own home, and you're totally linked to the care team. The pro value proposition for payers, they actually meet the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and provide timely service. And the value proposition for providers you actually can have a sustainable, efficient model to take care of the needs of your marketplace and gain access to new markets through telehealth reimbursement models. This is a huge opportunity to dis disrupt. There's $106 billion that were spent in 2015 for inpatient and outpatient services. And think about it, if we just get 1% of the marketplace, that's $1 billion in five years. We've been very, very fortunate. We've only been around for one year, and we've gotten two customers with revenues of 350,000 this year, and we're projecting revenues of 1 to 0.7. And our business model is based on a PMPM -PM pricing model, but ultimately, we like to take risk. So we've been working with some of the most elite organizations around the country. We're doing a clinical trial with McLean Hospital, connected with Harvard working with a group of schizophrenics. We're working with Montefiore Medical Center and their comorbid conditions patients in their pioneer ACL model. And now we've just come up with a proposal with the city of Louisville. So join us in reinventing behavioral health and help us to help others. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Werfel. I'm an endocrinologist here in the Texas Medical Center. And as you can all imagine, I am a large prescriber of pharmaceutical products uh, in the care of my patients with chronic uh, medical problems. So I have over 20 years of practice in uh, medicine, seeing firsthand the interruptions that pharmaceutical representatives can impact on my clinic. They're disruptive. They interrupt my clinic. I'm commonly have a iPad following me around to get signatures from the pharmaceutical reps. It's not a practical model. So I was thrilled when uh, I came to learn of our next new company, Express, to learn that they have a platform that's going to make those uh, easier for me. The pharmaceutical reps are very valuable. Their information, their um, patient education, their product information. In the Affordable Care Act and the current, current insurance um, changes, coupons, samples, formulary products, et cetera, are very important to me and being able to prescribe the proper medication uh, for these patients. So uh, when I learned of Express and their CEO and founder, Kimberly Corbett, I was excited to work with them and uh, try to bring this product to fruition. Kimberly is a former pharmaceutical rep herself and understands the relationship between the physician and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this is her second startup and uh, one that I'm looking forward to continue to work with. Um, and develop to help all clinicians as they work through patient problems. Um, the uh, Express platform is a business model that puts the doctors in charge of the pharmaceutical relationship. Please join me in welcoming Kimberly Corbett. 